Russia's attack on Ukraine has upended the lives of people throughout the region, driving a wedge between neighbors, friends, families. As the war reached the six-month mark, Ukrainians commemorated their national holiday in fear, defiance, and sorrow over the absence of those who have departed. In neighboring Russia, repression has intensified. Can resistance survive? And what about in Belarus, Putin's trusted ally, some would say vassal? On to the point, we're asking, tragic triangle, is Putin destroying Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia? Welcome to To The Point. It is a great pleasure to greet our guests. Ekaterina Shulman is a political scientist and associate professor at the Moscow School for the Social and Economic Sciences, who left Russia in April to take up a fellowship at the Robert Bosch Stiftung here in Germany. And it's a pleasure to welcome Olga Konsevievich. She is from Ukraine. She's currently journalist in residence at the Berlin Social Sciences Center, WZB. She's been overseeing reporting for the online news portal 24TV from her base here in Germany. And also with us is Belarusian freelance journalist and author Marina Rakhle. She works with the German Marshall Fund and has written extensively about her homeland. Olga, in his speech on Ukraine's Independence Day, President Zelensky said Ukraine is, quote, a nation reborn. Would you say that's true? And if so, what is new about Ukraine since the war? Yes, yeah, thank you for this question, because now I feel that we are united more than ever. And I can say that I didn't feel it before, because we had many troubles, many like fights uh, uh, inside our country and many different opposition questions. But now I feel that we are united because we have a really big threat in front of us. And I believe that now we will have more time for building some new version of Ukraine, some better version, because now we see that uh, we deserve and we can resist even if we have a lack of time, a lack of, a lack of resources, even if we have some problems that like not depend on us, but still we have strong allies and we have many opportunities to reach new goals. And I guess after this war, and I believe that it will be a victory of Ukraine and that uh, we will reach our goal uh, of free Ukraine uh, and uh, we will liberate all the territories that now uh, occupied by Russia. So I guess that after that we will have a new, better Ukraine that uh, will show all the world that uh, we managed and even if you have some ob obstacles you can overcome it. So yeah, I, I hope we will have a great example of some strong democracy because before people like usually called us like young democracy and so on but yeah now i guess and we I have to come back to exactly yeah, yeah. that yeah. point uh, in a moment ekaterina as ukraine was commemorating its independence day russian police were arresting the uh, one of the most vocal critics who still is in russia namely yevgeny rotsman the well, former... one of the last i think uh, opposition politicians remaining at large exactly and uh, he was formerly mayor of Yekaterinburg, uh, he said as he was led away, I'm quoting, we know all there is to know about our country. This, meaning his arrest, is nothing new. How much do average Russian citizens really know about the war itself and also about the level of repression in the country? Since the uh, beginning of the invasion, about 7,000 online resources were blocked uh, by uh, the Russian authorities, by the prosecutor office or uh, Roskomnadzor. And this is just online. Uh, the uh, most popular radio station in uh, Moscow, Echo of Moscow, was closed in the first days of March. Uh, the only oppositional TV channel, uh, TV Rain, stopped operating about the same time. So we should not underestimate the degree of control over the uh, information sphere. Uh, television, although declining in popularity, and there's a, there has been an especially sharp decline during the last six months, is still number one source of information for an average citizen, especially or 
to be more specific, for citizens uh, aged uh, above 50, which is or rather uh, older than 55, which is also coincidentally uh, the main group of support for uh, the things that are happening for any uh, actions of the uh, authorities. So there's this direct correlation between media consumption and uh, political position, political views and, and pronouncements. Um, on the internet, in YouTube or in Telegram, there's certainly uh, access to alternative uh, points of view. Telegram, in including, of course, your own YouTube channel. You have over a million viewers, as I understand. Uh, subscribers, yes. Um, this may be the sign, uh, not, not so much of my own progress as an information source, but of the hunger for any sort of uh, alternative, uh, alternative information. Yes, uh, the main beneficiary is, has been YouTube and uh, Telegram. It's interesting that Russian authorities, generous as they are with their blockings uh, and closing down of media outlets, are yet uh, wary of uh, blocking YouTube, uh, which is immensely popular among, among the people also for the non-political content. So uh, the answer to your question as to any question about Russia is both yes and no. Uh, there's a scarcity of information available to those who would not seek it intentionally. Uh, so if they just turn on TV or if they uh, open uh, their uh, browser page and then uh, the most popular uh, first page will be Yandex, then they will not see any other point of view rather than official one. But if they choose to dive a little deeper, then uh, there are certainly uh, sources that can afford. Do they uh, have to use the VPN as in Belarus to uh, access certain VP services? VPN consumption has increased 100% uh, in since uh, since February. So now it's, it's quite a household tool. But uh, the... Um, I I'm think told that the authorities can trace VPN use. VPN numbers, of course, are the numbers that people use to try to access the internet from, if not from open Russia, sources yeah. beyond their own countries. But I'm told that is traceable. Uh, I think we shouldn't scare people over much with thinking what the authorities may or may not do. So far, uh, the use of VPN is not criminalized in Russia, so people are uh, using it. It's funny that here in Germany, I had to install a VPN that pretends that I'm accessing internet from Russia because I need, for my professional work, I need access to official sites like sites of the Russian ministries, and these are blocked from here. One of the many paradoxes of this war. Marina, let's, let me ask you about a paradox uh, in Belarus. Uh, Belarusian President Lukashenko has, of course, allowed his country's territory to be used by Russia to stage its war, including missile bases that have fired into Ukraine. Yet, he congratulated Ukraine on its Independence Day and said that he is convinced, and again, I'm quoting, that today's contradictions will not destroy the centuries-old foundation of good neighborly relations. Is this pure cynicism on his part, or does it indicate that there are limits to Belarus's support for Russia? Um, I guess it clearly indicates that there are limits to what you should take seriously, what's coming from the current uh, Belarusian or from, from, from the current Belarusian um, government and the president. Uh, there was this congratulation. One of the, one of the wordings was that he wished the um, uh, peaceful skies to the Ukrainian nation, and uh, Ukrainians were, say, were, were um, writing that uh, in the afternoon uh, the shellings uh, of the Ukrainian cities were done from the Belarusian territory. And it's interesting that one of the, um, probably for me um, personally, the amazing thing that this war very clearly revealed is that um, Probably coming from the from this you know, post-Soviet background, being born in post-Soviet Belarus, uh, gr grown up there, um, we also tend to think that we know our neighbors, that we are basically all the same. The Russians, the Ukrainians, the Belarusians, more or less the same uh, nations, uh, post-Soviet nations. But basically the last 30 years, every country had, uh, had lived their own life and developed in different directions. Um, Ukraine, the Ukrainians, has never experienced the authoritarian uh, you know, rule hand uh, the way uh, Belarusians and Russians did. They cannot 
grasp it. Why Belarusians and Russians are not out there uh, in the street protesting? Um, of, I yeah, mean, when it's so easy, I mean, when they you know the, the, they, yeah, it's so they, simple. You just they get know, out. I mean, rationally, they know the cost of it, that you will be in prison. But because in, in Ukraine, for the last 30 years, it was possible to go out and protest. Not and then Belarus time, for... Like when we talk about the Yanukovych, for example, it also it was uh, sometimes very terrifying to go out on streets and to protest. And we saw it in 2014. So we also, we came through this. So I guess we don't know exactly what you experienced like in Russia and Belarus, but we also believe that if it's like a large amount of people, it's like a big crowd, you can't pack everyone to Autozak, yeah? That's right. They, they, uh, that's, in Belarus that's in 2020, they years. had huge crowds. 30 years of... Uh, and I mean, a disclaimer probably that, of course, the, the sufferings of Belarusians and Russians, you cannot in, in any remote way compare it to what Ukrainians are going through with the, with the bombings and shellings and people dying. But uh, it's um, the situation where the protest is there but uh, it, it takes other forms. It's in the underground. It's, I don't know, that, that, that in the main thoroughfare of Minsk, there will be an open window and uh, the uh, anthem of Ukraine will be blasting out. Mm -hmm. uh, people showing their attitude, but in, in a very limited way, possibilities that they have. And I want to come back to exactly that, but we have a short report and I'd like to take a closer look uh, at life in all three countries, Ukraine, Russia and Belarus. Sorrow, worry and fear coexist with a strange normality in all three as people go about their business. Everything seems normal here in the Ukrainian city of Kramatorsk, not far from the front line. We are so tired because of the war. Meanwhile, in neighboring Belarus, President Lukashenko is presenting himself as a caretaker. The opposition, once powerful, languishes in exile or prison. No one dares rebel against the dictator's unholy alliance with Russian President Vladimir Putin, who has a firm grip on his country. In Moscow and St. Petersburg, everything seems normal. Cafes and bars are full. Only a courageous few still dare to openly criticize the war of aggression. Meanwhile, in the Siberian provinces where most soldiers are recruited, families mourn more and more fallen sons. But even in Ukraine, critical voices are growing. Protesters fear that as the war drags on, democracy and the achievements of the Orange Revolution will fall by the wayside. Can there be freedom for Ukraine only if there is also freedom for Russia and Belarus? And straight on to you, Olga. It's a big one. Yeah, I remember, like, uh, Tikhonovska said this, yeah? I guess it was uh, her quote. But, uh, you know, I guess, yeah, we're all in the same uh, like informational space, even if you now want to divide, yeah, our uh, culture and our uh, common um, uh, ecosystem, heritage. yeah, and heritage. But anyway, like we like influence to each other. So anyway, we will need to get back to that dialogue. Maybe after the war. Maybe now we are too emotional. Even I, like, I listen to, like, Russian music, read many Russian books, for example. Yeah, I read the book that, uh, I guess, Katerina edited, uh, the Spinkler book about, yeah. The Better Angels uh, of Our Nature, that, about the global decline of violence. Yes, yeah, one of my now, favorite books ever. Yeah. yeah, so, like, for, he told that for, like, uh, last, like, 70 years, we see these uh, decreases of some violence in the world and no... The big countries almost never go yeah, to war with each other yeah, yeah, any yes. longer. So. That was shattered on February 24th, 2022. Now we're experiencing this, yeah, so, and even like some great, beautiful minds, they were wrong, yeah. So that is why I can't, like, say, like, maybe uh, exactly what will happen next, but I guess that we all make something uh, brilliant on our own uh, like way. For example, I see many Belarusian people who now joined some uh, special um, 
uh, regimes of Ukrainian army. I see uh, uh, like Russian people who helped us here, like for example, on a train station, just to translate something from German or to send uh, like some, I don't know, special letters to administration and so on. And they were very helpful and uh, all that uh, things, they really matters. So I get that maybe we all need to uh, do something um, uh, that we can do as like uh, a person independently, yeah, and then it will bring some result. Let me just ask you, because our report ended uh, with uh, protests in Ukraine itself, mm -hmm. and we talked about Ukraine being reborn, you talked about Ukrainian mm -hmm. democracy. How stable and free is Ukraine today? President Zelensky has become a hero to millions of people around the world, <laughs> and yet there has been some criticism, uh, particularly after he fired the head of the intelligence service and also the state prosecutor, some questions raised mm -hmm. uh, about democracy and its viability in Ukraine. First of all, democracy is very broad, like term, and uh, like even some like big scientists, they like also find <laughs> about like what is the democracy meaning now. But if we talk about Ukraine, it's really nice that we have this changes of some um, uh, public uh, um, leaders, some like really big decisions, it means that something works. And also I can tell you that people in Ukraine, they are so critical to the power and they are so like uh, sometimes angry with our officials. So it's they... It's national tradition, Yeah, it's yes. now traditional to go uh, to the streets and to protest. So believe me, if something will happen, they will stop Zelensky. But I also could explain you that, for example, our Ukrainian constitution states that uh, president of Ukraine needs to bring this uh, uh, command as a chief of, of an army if something like happened. So that is why it's also his uh, like direct decision and his um, um, uh, need to um, rule the country during such uh, war time. So it's not uh, like authoritarianism. It's just uh, the matter of time and it's just uh, decla declared in our constitution. So he behaved like this because he have a right. Ekaterina, yes. how firm is Putin's uh, grip? Our, our report asked the question, uh, can there only be uh, true freedom for Ukraine if Russia and Belarus are free? When could that day come? That's a good question, a million dollar question, I would say. Uh, so far, our Russian ruling elite has demonstrated a certain degree of unity. Uh, the civic authorities, the financial authorities have demonstrated much higher competence than the military ones. It's a kind of a paradox that uh, the power that be relies so much on security services and on the military that has done so badly on security services that have, has, have misinformed the president on such a grand way, while the much despised uh, civic uh, bureaucracy has continued to hold the country together to... Uh, preserve the economy in the midst of uh, the uh, sanctions storm uh, so this is this is kind of kind of uh, kind of ironic but uh, at this point we must say that uh, Russian power machine is I can say comparatively stable but it is kind of preventing the collapse uh, so it is possible still for an average uh, Russian to live as if nothing much uh, has happened. You managed to leave the country. Um, many, many others have left as well. Does this brain drain of critics, uh, oppositional voices, does it help or hurt the opposition? Uh, it certainly helps uh, the regime uh, by um, leaving out the necessity of a real wide uh, full-scale repressive campaign. Uh, it, it has been in the nature of our political regime to push the critics to leave rather than to uh, prevent them from living in the Soviet or uh, German uh, manner. So after February 24th, it has accelerated, this exodus has been tremendous. I have begun to realize it only after I have arrived here myself. I've been much more fortunate than many others. I was not under any direct threat, so I came uh, to basically to, to enjoy my fellowship, but many, many of my colleagues, my 
friends, uh, people who were uh, teachers in the same universities that I taught in, they were obliged to leave because of uh, direct uh, danger. And this is an extremely sad thing for, for the country in general. We can imagine that it's better for the opposition, for the oppositionally minded rather to be at large than to be in prison, but uh, it's sad and tragic to realize how many people, educated people, creative people, have chosen to leave the country rather than to uh, remain. I can't say that it, it in any way brings closer the, uh, the times of common and, freedom which you mentioned. And Mavinia, where does the opposition movement stand in Belarus today? We talked about, or it was mentioned, the massive protests in 2020 uh, after Alexander Lukashenko uh, was accused of manipulating the election. Um, has the opposition been snuffed out since then? It's, um, it wouldn't be serious to talk about opposition inside the country at this point of time. I mean, what we've been observing in Russia for the last half a year has been taking place in Belarus for, for two years now. Since the end of the protests and the, and the, this, this, um, the wave of repressions unrolled over the country, it has not stopped. Uh, it, it has never stopped. Uh, as of yesterday, there have been 1,300 political uh, prisoners in Belarus. Um, for for in in terms of the of Germany, it, it's 11,500. So 11,000 political prisoners, and uh, three, 33,000 arrested. That would make almost 300,000 in uh, Germany in terms in, 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 in the proportion in terms of numbers uh, in, of in the Russia, German population. I think 500 people have been designated political prisoners by a memorial. So, and Russia is, <laughs> let me remind you, a much larger country than Belarus. So yes, I meet so many uh, Belarusian immigrants here in, in Berlin. If Ukraine were to actually succeed in winning the conflict with Russia, would that also have a follow-on effect for Lukashenko? Uh, definitely, yes. That's uh, the, to use the famous uh, motto, the words of the um, Belarusian and Polish hero Tadeusz Kostyushka for our freedom and yours, uh, what Ukrainians are um, heroically doing all this for uh, six months, uh, half a year, I mean the active phase of the war, because the war started eight years ago, they are um, their struggle is not only to, for a better future of Ukraine, but also Belarus and uh, Russia. Let me ask all of you, uh, and I want to come back to our title because uh, our, our show is, the clock is running. Um, we asked tragic triangle, whether Putin is destroying all three of your countries. And one of the most potent weapons that's being used in this conflict is, of course, nationalism. We saw it in the murder now of the daughter of the ultra-nationalist uh, Russian uh, Dugin, uh, Darya Dugina, was murdered, uh, apparently targeted attack at him. Uh, massive response by ultra-nationalists in Russia. Would you say that this nationalism is poisoning the region and will go beyond the conflict itself? Briefly, Olga? If we talk about like Ukrainian case, so it's uh, just, uh, it's irony because we don't have like a much uh, a larger group of nationalists, maybe some marginalized people, but we, you know, like nationalist parties, they didn't reach even like the level that they needed for the parliament. So I guess we need to be careful with this problem, not only like uh, you're talking about our region, post-Soviet region or Eastern Europe, but in EU, we also see that societies are polarized and there are many like people with this nationalist view, but not in that way as like Russian propaganda put it like on the table when uh, they talk about Ukraine. Ekaterina? In Russia, ethnic nationalism also enjoys rather marginal uh, support. Uh, it's, it's an exotic uh, creed, uh, imperial type of nationalism is more understandable to broader Russian public, but this is also propagated by uh, mostly by Russian state TV. Once you uh, turn turn it off or change the tenor, uh, then uh, this will also change. Uh, ethnic nationalism, what you call ultra nationalism, is not popular in Russia, and we have seen uh, various examples of that. Uh, if if it were, it would have enjoyed a renaissance in 2014, but this is not what happened. 
Yeah. Um, and I would say that um, any serious reconciliation efforts or dialogue in this tragic triangle, as you put it, could only be feasible um, when the war ended. Uh, I don't think it's possible for the three nations to uh, sit peacefully at the same table as we're doing now before um, Ukraine prevails and the war is over. Can you imagine Ukraine actually winning this war, Ekaterina? Ah, in postmodern times, war and victory and defeat are definable in, in very different ways. We have just mentioned that the war has been going on for eight years. So eight years hence, uh, how will we define war? When, when did it start and when will it end? But the best case scenario, the war ends, Ukraine uh, wins, uh, Russia... What, what does it mean? Getting back Crimea, stopping Russian yes, army? Yes, where yes, now the very, is? very best case scenario. Uh, this is not achievable by military means. I'm afraid I'm going to have to cut off our discussion right there. I'm so grateful to all of you for being with us here today, and I'm very glad to have all of you tuning in. See you soon.